recognize a few faces from those days. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here. So we're, we're going to jump into the word today. I understand Derek's been preaching on the kingdom, kingdom encounters. So we'll keep in alignment with that and look at Mark chapter 6 today. By the way, just I know you know this, but I love that we put the gospel in the center of the people. That represents the incarnation of our beloved Jesus. So let's look at him today. It's a, it's a more unusual passage where it takes a dip in his rejection in Nazareth. So uh, here was Derek's suggested main point, and this is great. This is a short little passage. We're going to keep it simple and just kind of walk through it. The main point being, Jesus faces rejection in Nazareth, showing the difficulty of unbelief. And the application is, how do we handle rejection and stay faithful to our calling? So we'll look at Jesus' rejection, and then we will apply that what it's like to be a Christian who's following Jesus and may suffer and face the exact same thing. So I'm sure uh, Derek's probably mentioned a few things about the book of Mark, but by way of introduction, I have just a couple brief points to give us context for the storyline that we're looking at today. Uh, as you probably know, the, the gospel of Mark was written from Peter's vivid memory. Uh, it's very early, likely written in the 50s. I mean, this, if you look at the timeline, it is like, right after the events. I mean, resurrection and book of Acts, this stuff is flowing. This was written very, very early. And I'll share with you a couple quotes uh, from the ESV study Bible on the introduction of Mark that I think uh, I, I just enjoyed. Mark is a docudrama consisting of noteworthy clips, events, snatches of dialogues, and narration. I think that's a good way to think of it, a docudrama, documenting something, but it's just highlights and snippets in this documentary in this drama, as Mark puts it. Another great uh, line for, that the ESV presented was regarding discipleship. Discipleship is being shaped by a relationship with Jesus. It also means being prepared to face the kind of rejection that Jesus faced. And that fits squarely with our passage today. Also, this Another way to describe uh, the Gospel of Mark and the account of Jesus is a hero story. All the Gospels are hero stories, but even heroes face rejection. So that's the theme of our reading today. I'm just going to jump into it and reiterate these six verses and make a few comments afterwards. And I'll, I'll keep bouncing back and forth between the real life rejection of Jesus and then also how we can relate to that. So we'll look at Jesus, we'll relate, we'll look at Jesus, and we'll relate. Right away on verse 1 it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. That's the intro line of this snapshot. The place he was coming from was this, this healing incident where um, he healed really two daughters. The daughter of Jairus and a woman who was bleeding, whom he called daughter. Um, so that's where he's coming from. His hometown was Nazareth, where he was a tradesman for probably roughly 20 years. So think about that. He would have probably entered that trade very young, like middle school age probably, uh, early adolescence. And by this time, when Jesus kind of breaks on the scene, everybody in this hometown had an image of him. Think about that. Think about in a small town, the tradesman who you'd seen working around from close to two decades maybe, all of a sudden he's back and you've heard these legends, these crazy stories. And he's got a gang with him. <laughs> he's got followers. So he comes back into town, he's, the legend is building, and he's got this gang of people with him, and it must have been very odd. It must have broken the expectations and sort of crystallized memories of this Jesus. We know this kid. <laughs> this was the guy that, you know, Fixed my plumbing and, and worked around the house and built nice things. I've got a chair right here. He may, is this the same guy? So, so maybe we can begin to understand the nature of what's happening here as we unpack it. So if we move on to verse 2. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogues. And many who heard him were astonished. Think, why, why the astonishment? saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? 
And I, I think this is just sort of shock. It's like a cognitive dissonance. They're not used to this version of Jesus, the up-and-coming legend with a gang of people with him. But he did teach. And this, was, this would have been the custom. So most likely in the synagogue, a passage of Scripture would have been read, and somebody would have taught on it afterwards. And um, I think this is why they're astonished. Their, their regular handyman wasn't just a preacher. He was, in fact, a king, a legend in the making. These, these were mighty works they had heard of. And fulfillment and the teaching and it's coming together, it was almost too, too large and grand to wrap their heads around. And we'll see how this unfolds. They're, they're struggling with it. Verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are his sisters not here with us? And they took offense at him. This is sort of the conclusion of this astonishment. They've sort of seen enough. He's here, and they took offense at him. It, it may seem sort of odd. They couldn't quite believe it, but why the offense? And I'm speculating here, but I wonder if what's wrapped up into this is maybe almost a classism. Maybe, maybe the recognition is elevating his status. Maybe. Who knows? Why do you think? Why would they take offense at him? Uh, Jesus was a humble man, but are they beginning to wonder, hey, this guy's a big deal. He's outgrown this whole town. Who, do, who does he think he is? You've certainly seen things like that probably in your life and situation and circumstances. I don't know. But they took offense at him. Clearly, they didn't believe. I'm just probing and, and speculating and taking interest in why wouldn't they believe? What's going on here? Something has changed and... They not only didn't buy it, they actually took offense at him. We're certain something changed. Why? Who knows? And I'm sure that varies. Everybody has their own emotional wrappings tied up into certain conclusions. Um, but I would say this. Seeing is believing is, is, a, is a common statement. But what did they see? And maybe they couldn't get beyond what they were seeing. Did they see kinship? Vocation, labels, but probably not the kingdom of God. They may have seen the common stuff. And that's an interesting challenge for us, is it not? Do we just see the common things, what's right in front of our eyes? Faith seems to see beyond that and accepts those wonderful things of God that we can't always see. What would it be like for Jesus not to be seen rightly? Did it hurt him? Was he frustrated? Was he more sad for them than him? He was fully human. We know that. What was that like for Jesus? I think the challenge here is to see beyond. Not, not just what's right there, but to bring a lens of God and the scripture and the Holy Spirit, especially as a Christian, into life and experiences and people and labels and what things should be. That's a good challenge for us. Let's look at verse 4. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household. I think Jesus kind of clarifies it there. It's, it's kind of a simple thing we can relate to going on. Sometimes that's difficult. Have you ever been away from your family for a while and you come back after years? Maybe something's changed in your life. Maybe God's enabled you to improve some things. Maybe there's some fruit of the spirit now on the vine that wasn't there. I can relate to that. You know, uh, when I go to my hometown, I'm, I'm, I never really returned. I was, you know, I'm still a high school kid that did sports. <laughs> it's just not my life anymore. It's different. It's a life of ministry, and it's, it's just funny. I don't know if you can relate to that. But I think there's some common truth in what Jesus is saying here. But look what Jesus does. I think he ties himself to Old Testament prophets here. But his default thinking and emotions adhere to the long timeline of God's revelation, not circumstances or what people say. Jesus models this wonderfully for us. He's thinking about, he's quoting the Old Testament, he's relating to the prophets, and he knows what God says is more important than what people say. Jesus was rejected by the Pharisees, that's religious, the Romans, that's government, by his hometown, that's family and friends. And by Satan, that's demonic. Can you relate to those things? That categorically sort of covers it all, doesn't it? In any life and circumstance and situation. 
I don't know if any one of those things in that list maybe presents you with a particular challenge or a rejection. But um, know this. Jesus can empathize. He's been through every category of rejection. And in fact, this rejection is a foreshadowing. In that hero story arc, he's gaining legend and kingliness. And this is a little, a little downslide. It's a little conflict in the story. But it's showing us the greater ultimate conflict that paradoxically would result in victory. The ultimate rejection is the cross. Where Jesus took full-on rejection, and, and it wasn't, um, he wasn't guilty of that. He, he, it wasn't uh, merited by him to be rejected, but he bore our reproaches. It's the beauty of the cross. This is just a little foreshadowing. When Jesus would, hear, would interrupt this, this relationship with God and, and utter the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the ultimate rejection. And he bore that for us so that we might have life in return. Verse 5. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And it seems like, um, at least at this point in the messianic timeline... Jesus didn't want to really prove himself. He could, he could have. I mean, he could have kind of waved his hand, opened the heavens, and said, Hey, Abraham, poke your head through the clouds. <laughs> Say something to these people. Like, verify me. I mean, I mean, Jesus really could have done some extraordinary things, but there was something about the messianic timeline, something about the doubt involved in the lack of faith. And in this case, um, he, there were some healings. But... Uh, he did teach. There were some healings. I would say there was evidence. But what would be enough? What's enough? Think about that for a second. What would it take for them to believe? I think they had enough evidence, but to them it wasn't enough. And, and what about us? Situationally, do circumstances really get hard sometimes? And we wonder, we doubt. I, I think we can all relate to that. If you're following Jesus, I would say doubt, situational doubts are probably part of life. But what's, what's the model in Christ to default to the scriptures? And I, th I think in instead of saying, you know, I, I don't have all the answers. I need more. If we, if we retool that a little bit and say, but do we have enough? I think we do. You know, uh, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah said, um, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I think we'll always be short of just knowing everything. We can't. We're not God. But I would submit, I do think we have enough. We've got this trustworthy scripture. And even, even if it was a teaching and a couple of healings, maybe it wasn't mighty works. In this case, I think that was enough. I, I don't know. What's your take? And when you get in those moments and it feels like, gosh, I just wish I knew, Lord, I don't know. Just be reminded of what you do know, what the revelation you have been given. Then I would submit that, that that is enough from our loving God. So um, he marveled because of their unbelief. So this passage sort of ends <laughs> on a down note. Let me um, maybe just uh, reiterate a couple, a couple thoughts in closing that are maybe, maybe applicable to your life, and we'll let the words of Paul give us our, our final, um, final send-off on this, this homily. Uh, in, in short, I've suggested maybe there's three things that could be helpful if you can relate to Jesus. In, in times in your life, you may feel rejected. Number one, see beyond. Number two, default to the scripture. And number three, discover it's enough. So seeing beyond might be seeing beyond the circumstance, the trigger, the foul word, the, the slight, the, the, whatever that challenge is, whatever it may, makes you feel rejected. Is it possible to see beyond that? I think to see the kingdom, to see what God's doing, to sort of elevate the vision in that thing. That's, I think, one thing that's helpful.
It's the thing that the people in Jesus' hometown missed. Second is modeled after Jesus to default to the scriptures. He sort of connected to the Old Testament. He did that when he was tempted in the wilderness. He quoted the scripture. That's the most reliable thing we have. And the Holy Spirit can illuminate that for those of us who know Christ. Defaulting to the scripture, not the circumstance or the environment always. And third, discover it's enough. Um, For his divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Those are the words also of Peter in one of his epistles. I think he's given us enough. Um, If you you want a little homework, look at the other uh, scriptures in the lectionary. They're excellent. They all relate on this idea of challenges and rejection and weakness. And I'm going to throw out one more uh, last thing as a specific instance of rejection. Uh, It may sound like it's somewhat out of left field because it's so niche, but I've been down a... uh, like a rabbit hole on rejection sensitivity dysphoria recently. My guess is maybe none of you have heard of that. Maybe some of you know what it is. Maybe some of you struggle with that. It, only people with ADHD have this. There's approximately 6 million in this country, but I couldn't help myself uh, reading this scripture and really have been having been thinking about that a lot lately because a couple people I really care about are suffering uh, a lot as a result. Maybe it's a little bit intuitive. RSD is rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria. And it's tough. And certain people are wired um, to receive that even more painfully than others. And so I think this relates. And um, have you ever been in that place maybe where, where something just, just hit you wrong? Maybe it was a rejection. It was at a sensitive point in your life, and it almost led to a dysphoria, where, where emotions become unregulated. And uh, that, that's a real feeling. And I'm not here to scold the feeling. I just want to say that um, Jesus is here for that. He's experienced rejection, and he's a loving, loving Savior. And I think some of, the, some of those uh, things I listed may be ways to consider... Um, coping with those very hard times, but, but know that Jesus is with you. When no one can feel what you feel, know that Jesus does. Learn to hear his voice, what he says about you. Not what triggers hurt, not what someone else says, but what Jesus says about you. He, he is a lover of your person, your soul. He made you and he died for you. There's no greater, grander demonstration of his love than that. And he says you're worth it and that you have value. So feel his love when you sense the familiar sting of rejection. And I, I will end with uh, the words of Paul. This will be our, our final, final words. Uh, it's a snippet from, from uh, our New Testament reading which I think goes right along with uh, this I- the idea of, as a follower of Christ, what it's like to experience rejection. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. That was a certain uh, problem. That it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.